Thank you so much for being here on this really cold and weak night. I'm sure taking time away from your busy schedule. So really happy to see so many people here to discuss something we're really excited about and excited to see so many other people interested. Um, so welcome to Climate Smart San Jose Town Hall. My name is Ashwini Kantak. I'm the Assistant Director of the Environmental Services Department in the City of San Jose. And we are the ones leading uh, the development of this plan along with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. So I have Sean Fernando and Trip Barstel here uh, who've been great partners. Uh, and then we've also been working with a lot of other city departments. We also have uh, some, you know, members of my amazing team from ESD. So we have Aaron and Jenny and um, Amanda in the back there. And uh, we are hoping we can keep the presentation to about half an hour and then really have the rest of the time for Q&A. We're also getting questions through email, and so we'll try and address some of those and uh, some from the audience here. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of context before I hand it off to Sean and Tripp to take us through the meat of the presentation. And so again, we've been leading this plan ESD has along with the mayor's office um, and many other departments in the city. Um, and also with the help of a lot of technical experts, um, nonprofits from the community. Uh, so it's been great engagement, great learning process for us. And we hope that what we've, uh, what sort of developed as an outcome of that engagement is something that we can really get the community excited about. And so um, we, we believe this is a people-centered plan. Uh, our tagline is really a people-centered plan for a low-carbon city. Uh, we strongly believe this plan, it's, it's, we take pride in the fact that it is based on data. There is a very thick technical appendix which we will be um, adding to the plan. Um, uh, still kind of working on some of the numbers, but um, it's based on data. It's really meant for the people, so it's not just about the environment, but it is about how can we make the quality of life better for a San Jose community, businesses and residents equally. Uh, we really want it to be inclusive, so it's not just meant for people who can afford certain things, who can afford to make expensive upgrades or afford expensive electric um, vehicles, but it's, it's really about engaging the entire community and making it work for them. And, um, you know, it is ready for implementation. I mean, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a big lift, so obviously we can't lay out every single specific action but we have laid out a clear vision. Um, and again, it's based on direction that we had from council. So it is a pretty uh, narrow scope. And we'll talk a little bit about sort of how we're looking at next phases as well. Um, so we, we uh, in 2015, and in, in actually just going back, in 2007, San Jose was a leader in adopting the green vision. So it had 10 ambitious goals, and really it was about the economy, environment, and quality of life. Um, we built on that in 2015. The mayor and council um, asked us to focus our, um, you know, kind of the, the green vision was already pretty operationalized w within the city. And the green vision was um, really more about city actions. And we can't bring about major change by just city hall doing stuff. We really need to engage everybody. And so um, we, we were asked to kind of focus on greenhouse gas emissions related to mobility and energy, and then also to look at how we could have a sustainable water supply. And that was the foundation and kind of the genesis of this plan that we're going to present today. So obviously, it is missing several things like solid waste, which we know contributes to emissions. We haven't looked at open space. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so it was a sharper focus, partly because um, it was really about greenhouse emissions and sort of looking at the biggest sources. And Sean will talk a little bit about how, uh, through his modeling, we were able to kind of uh, put our attention towards certain strategies related to energy um, and mobility. And when I say mobility, I'm talking about land use as well as transportation, so not just the transportation in infrastructure. And we feel that, you know, um, at the national level, there isn't much action on climate change, and so the cities are stepping up. 
uh, all over the nation. And so we, uh, we are really proud of the fact that uh, San Jose is kind of taking on this leadership role and that we're building on a legacy of leadership that we've had in sustainability. Uh, we are among the nation's uh, leaders in terms of EVs and solar installations. And again, like I said, everybody stands to benefit. I mean, that was really important to us as we were looking at the different strategies, um, kind of what was the biggest bang for the buck in terms of emission reduction, uh, in terms of cost, and then also in terms of how it could improve the quality of life for, for the San Jose community. And so um, we have, um, and Sean will talk more about the metrics, but they are, again, the plans database. We've derived, we, we believe we're one of the first cities to come up with a plan to meet the Paris Accords, uh, which is something council directed us to do. Uh, kind of once we had, we were already underway with the plan, but we were able to adapt and uh, were happy to do so. And so uh, we've based our, um, you know, one of the directions we had for the consultants was to look at everything else the city had already sort of prioritized, the various plans that were in place, and to build upon the general plan, which um, as many of you may have been engaged, uh, involved about six or 7,000 residents in the development of the general plan. So we wanted to make sure we, we were building on that and not kind of diverging with a different direction. And um, so I think with that, I, I'll just walk you through kind of what we're gonna cover. And like I said, we'll have a lot of time at the end for Q&A. And so we're gonna kind of go over why we're doing this, uh, what's been our journey to date in terms of the work we've done and the engagement we've been able to um, have in the community as well as uh, with technical experts. We'll talk about sort of Climate Smart San Jose, what was, uh, what was our approach, what was our methodology. And then obviously the most important thing is how are we gonna implement? Again, it's not just City Hall that can do it, it's really gonna mean engaging everybody, um, residents, businesses, not just in terms of taking action, but also in terms of sort of enabling uh, smart technologies to be developed in terms of infrastructure. We have to work with a lot of our regional agencies. And so we'll walk you through that and then we'll have questions here and we are streaming this. Um, so for those of you who wanna um, send us questions, please email us at cs sj at sanjoseca.gov, and we'll be sure to take those as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Uh, good evening, everybody. We are really pleased to be here, and uh, just to echo Ashwini's comments, so we appreciate you turning out on this cold night. Um, I'm still warming up my fingers, so if my hands are in my pockets, that's why. Um, just to introduce uh, myself, uh, I'm Sean Fernando, as Ashwini said, I'm on, and I'm joined by my colleague Trip Borsell. Uh, we belong to PwC's uh, Sustainable Cities practice, and we go around the country helping cities uh, develop strategies and plans to become more sustainable, to grow in terms of economic development, to plan for the future of infrastructure, and to reach uh, equitable outcomes for citizens. And, and there's a flurry of work that's emerging, and a lot of cities are taking up the mantle on addressing each of these issues, and we feel like we're in a very kind of special moment of time in, in uh, kind of doing this work. So we've been really pleased to assist the city of San Jose and uh, Kerry Ashwini and her team here in developing one of the first um, Paris-aligned climate action plans of any city, and we'll go into a bit of detail what exactly that means. Um, just in terms of uh, the order of the evening, we're gonna do a really quick presentation. Uh, we'll try not to bore you to death with slides as consultants sometimes do. Um, and then we'll really open up the floor to uh, Q&A. And specifically when we're asking for questions, what we're looking for is how can we drive uh, and accelerate the plan's adoption? Because you know, we can have a, perfect, you know, a pitch perfect plan and make all the right kind of statements, but what's really important is the extent and the degree to which the plan is um, embraced by the community. Good. So just to cover why we are doing this in the first place. Um, a lot has already happened in the last year on, on climate and cities. It's been pretty interesting. Um, the, you know, 
the, the decision by the federal government to uh, withdraw U.S. participation from the Paris Climate Agreement has really created a, a groundswell of movement of cities stepping up and, um, and adopting and honoring the Paris Agreement in, in lieu of that. And that's really important because, as you well know, cities are often on the front line of climate change. Uh, they are principal drivers for what causes climate change because they tend to be you know, pretty dirty places to, to live in in terms of a pollutant point of view. But that it's also where a lot of the innovation and the potential happens and sits for, um, for cities to develop and scale the technologies and policies and behavior that's required for uh, wide, uh, wide scale climate action. And it's also worth saying that uh, on this picture here, California is on the front line from initiatives such as Climate Mares, uh, which, is, you know, which was mobilized in May 2017 to bring on nearly 400 cities um, representing over 70 million people in the US, or at least a, a fifth of the US population have now elected to honor and adopt the Paris Agreement. And then looking a little bit more locally, with San Jose also being one of the first cities uh, to develop a comprehensive plan to implement this. You can start to get a sense that we're in a kind of turning point um, and, a kind of, and, and that San Jose is in a special place as being one of the first of those hopefully 400 cities to develop their own plans for uh, adopting and honoring the Paris Agreement. One of these key tangible moves um, has been the approval of the largest community choice energy program in the country, giving the one million residents of San Jose ownership of how they source and how they price their electricity. So that's in the context of an already very ambitious um, decarbonization and renewable energy program at the state level to, um, to increase the share of renewables and increase energy efficiency. And San Jose is accelerating beyond that. So it's testament to the work and and the support that the city can count on in the community to develop and scale these kind of programs. And as we go through the slides, we'll see just how significant a move this is in, in terms of helping the city get on a Paris Line trajectory. Sorry, I was told to speak into the mic a little bit more. Is that better? Can everybody at the back hear me? Great, thanks. So we're going to speak a little bit about this concept called the good life. And what we mean by that is that San Jose is a typical American city in many ways. It's relatively new, being incorporated around the same time that you know, technologies such as the railroad and the telegraph started to come online. And most of its development and growth has actually happened in the period since the Second World War, where planners built the city for what Americans or what they thought Americans wanted at the time. And that typically tended to look like a, you know, a suburban middle-class, you know, two-car garage home, um, you know, where you can drive to and from work each day. It turns out that this pattern of life, you know, large suburban homes in residential enclaves far away from local amenities and, you know, where you, uh, far away from local amenities and far away from where you work or where your kids go to school is actually pretty unsustainable. And it makes sense when you think about it, you know, if you're in a residential enclave where, you know, you are a five, just a five minute drive from the grocery store, it doesn't sound like much, but that's five minutes in a vehicle that's, uh, you know, combusting uh, gasoline and producing emissions. So that kind of pattern of development is pretty unsustainable. And a lot of research shows that it actually doesn't make us any happier. And so what we have on this kind of slide here is that uh, is an analysis to show how much we actually pay to, uh, to fulfill and achieve that kind of lifestyle, that lifestyle of uh, a large single family home with two parking spots for your cars uh, and with the extra bedroom that you don't need. And it turns out that we actually work about 87 days each year simply to pay off our rent or our home loan. Where in San Jose, the medium uh, home costs about a million dollars. You can start to see that how um, inequitable this is as a current way of you know, living in, in the urban context. And the other thing that we can call out is if you add those little segments at the bottom, you know, transportation, um, uh, you know, gasoline and insurance, we work about 44 days each year to afford us the luxury. It's the luxury of what? It's sitting in traffic on the 101, trying to get somewhere where you want to be, right? So 
in addition to that 44 days of actually paying for it, it would spend nine days sitting in traffic as well. And then additionally, there's research to show that if your income is, you know, let's say $50,000 per year in, in San Jose, and we cut an hour from your commute each day, so half an hour going to work, let's say, and half an hour coming back, that hour saved is equivalent in monetary terms to a, let's call it a happiness benefit worth an additional $40,000. So, you know, the, the science is there to say that, um, you know, there are behavioral economics at play that if you create the right kind of conditions for people to live closer to, you know, where they need to go and where they want to work, there's actually a monetary benefit involved in terms of, you know, the economics of people being happy. And that's quite an interesting concept. And so when we think about urban sustainability and, you know, the Paris-aligned Climate Action Plan of San Jose, we also need to think about the aspirations and the behaviors that have given rise to this configuration of, um, of the way that you know, we live and work in the city. And so part of that is understanding what drives happiness. And it turns out that the things that make us happy you know, aren't really the material goods, but the ability to spend time with friends, you know, to be more healthy and active, and to you know, access and uncover new you know, urban experiences or, or, nature, uh, or natural and open space right on our doorstep. Okay, you're doing this stuff, right? <laughs> I'm going to pass you over to Trip just to explain some of our story to date, and then I'll pick this up uh, to talk through some of the strategies of Climate Smart San Jose. Hi, everyone. I'm Trip Borstal. I'm with PwC. Nice to see all of you here. I see many of you have printed out copies of your plans in your hands. Can you just raise your hand if you have one in your... You do? Great. And just out of curiosity, how many of you have attended uh, a previous session, either a workshop or a town hall? In uh, Great. Thank you. Great to see your faces again. So I want to just take you through a quick journey of how we got to the plan that we have today. So this graph is foundational, and I'll walk you through it just for a moment, is that on the, the red line that you see there, is this getting turned on? Ah. So that red line you see there represents uh, the carbon emissions history of the city of San Jose, and then that you see at that inflection point is what we call business as usual. So if we did nothing, uh, um, this would be the likely trajectory of carbon emissions for the, the city of San Jose if it continued to grow and develop as it has grown and developed in the, in the past. Now, the lines that you see below, the two lines are one, the green one, or the blue one, is AB 32, or these are California laws around and goals around the reduction of carbon emissions. And the orange line beneath that is the trajectory for the city uh, if it was to meet the Paris Climate Agreement. And the reason why we show this is because it's foundational to the work that we did. So when you're in a boat, and if it happens to be sinking, you don't look around and ask, how much can you bail out? You ask, how much do we need to bail out? It actually provides a great way to say, how far do we need to go, and what do we need? To, how much carbon do we need to reduce in order to be aligned with the goals that the state of California has and what's in the Paris Climate Agreement. So this was our measuring stick and coming up with a means for being able to, to come up with the strategies that you see today. So this also shows uh, where the city of San Jose in context of other cities. So you see it's somewhat in the middle there. It, um, it benefits, it's far better than uh, cities that are outside the state of California. California benefits from a relatively clean energy grid as well as energy efficiency uh, regulations such as Title 24. Um, it also, believe it or not, is uh, a little less sprawling than many other, um, kind of call it post-World War II cities um, in the country. Um, but it's, around, it's right kind of around the middle. So, you know, it's not the worst, but it certainly has room for improvement. So that was our fact base. 
And so in addition to the analytical work that we did, we also engaged uh, members of the community. So we engaged some of the Bay Area's leading thinkers in water, in energy, and in mobility to help think of what are the strategies or measures that the city of San Jose, or the city that San Jose can take in order to be able to meet those target uh, emissions. So we conducted four workshops around different topics and really engaged them on how do we solve this really complex uh, problem. So those were very helpful in terms of capturing uh, a number of ideas. In addition, we had a town hall format uh, back in early April. Um, it's listed some ideas there. Uh, and then we also went around to different communities in the cities and to their council district meetings and went through presentations somewhat like this around the good life, but also asking them, what else would you like to see in the plan? We also did a survey, which we promoted at the, Earth, uh, the Earthquakes game, and both asked for ideas as well as asked this question about the good life and what do the residents of San Jose think about the good life? And this is a wordle of uh, the responses, and not surprisingly, it's very much about having time uh, and being able to you know, have time, have freedom, and be able to connect with friends and family. So that was very helpful for us in confirming you know, the values that the city of San Jose and the residents have are very much aligned with what our research has been showing about uh, the desire behind the good life. So that's just barely legible, isn't it? So the uh, process that we went through, we kicked off about a year ago in this room with a study session with the council. And um, we began actually doing some uh, community outreach with the town hall in the workshops, really through about the middle of the summer. And in that time, we were also doing a lot of the analysis uh, in, in the plan. We also did the survey, we did the workshops, um, and then we came back to the council in August to give them an update of where we were in with the plan and also to be able to get their, uh, their input. We also met with the Youth Commission in uh, August, um, which was a um, great, and they had some fantastic ideas and some very uh, difficult questions and that they weren't afraid to bring forth and ask, um, which was great and actually uh, forced us to be able to think a lot about implementation. They were very focused on, all right, this is great, we agree with it, but how do you actually implement this and engage the community around it? Um, and then we, uh, when we were starting to develop the band, we circled back with uh, a lot of the stakeholders that um, had expressed concern or ideas, and then we're here today. Right. Oh, yeah, I'll do this one, and then you uh, do the next. All right, we're tag teaming here. So. There were some principles as we put together the plan that were really important. So the analysis was clearly very important and, and foundational, as I mentioned, but also, you know, that was really centered around people and really around the good life. Sustainability has, you know, been not very attractive and has not garnered a lot of market success because the messaging for the past 20 years has not been inspiring and actually runs counter to our own drives uh, and aspirations as, as human beings. So we really wanted to be about centered around the good life, but we also wanted to make sure it was inclusive. As Ashwini mentioned, this wasn't just about upgrades to homes or cars for those who could afford those, um, but really around aligning this plan with the greater vision and the general plan for the city of San Jose, which is to be able to grow in a way that it can accommodate all of San Jose's uh, residents. So to be able to drive more transit-oriented development, create more neighborhood spaces, really be able to grow the city in such a way that it works, works for all. Also really important was it for it to be implementation ready. And by implementation ready, meaning like there were actions that various stakeholders from residents to businesses, uh, to regional agencies, in addition to, of course, the city could take as soon as today or yesterday uh, to actually start to put this plan into place. So those were four really guiding principles for us as we were developing the plan. 
The other document that was really foundational to him was the general plan. So the general plan is a, I would say, a bold vision for the city, and it has a great vision and vague uh, goals, aspirational goals in it. And you could think of this plan as very closely aligned with many of the modules and many of the goals that are outlined in that in that plan. So I think 73%. And that's very helpful because then you can think of this plan really as a way to implement portions of the general plan um, and the aspects that are in there. So it is very much the plan, the sustainability plan is very much geared towards what actions can are can best reduce carbon emissions. Uh, as well as be able to create benefits for um, uh, those who take it and for the city, as well as actually make the city a, uh, a stronger and, and um, a good place to live. With that, I'll turn it over back to Sean. Thank you, Trip. Thanks. Um, so this picture on the screen is an important one. It outlines the structure and the components and the building blocks of Climate Smart San Jose. And it looks a little bit complex on, kind of on, on first view, but I'll talk through each of those tiers in succession. Um, so it's also worth saying that this is, you know, if you want to think of the plan as a plan on a page, this is the kind of graphic and the picture that you, know, you ought to think about. So starting from the top, we've outlined uh, these, we've introduced these three pillars framed, about, uh, framed around the Good Life 2.0, and this really came through the deep kind of community engagement exercises that Trip was just discussing. And we wanted to, these to be um, the design principles with how we develop the subsequent strategies that were going to move the needle uh, for San Jose. And so these are, you know, the first one is a, a sustainable and climate smart city. I think we can all agree that we'd like that. Yes, um, a vibrant city of connected and focused growth, which speaks to the fact that San Jose's population is forecast to grow considerably over the next 25, 30 years, and we need a way of accommodating that future growth in a way that is sustainable and that is not causing additional disbenefit from a climate perspective. And the third key pillar um, is an economic, uh, economically inclusive city of opportunity. So we know that San Jose is a bedroom community. Uh, a lot of residents live here, and people tend to work elsewhere in Silicon Valley, whether that's Mountain View um, or Palo Alto or, or somewhere else. And so this third pillar is really around how can we enable and activate the private sector and commercial enterprises to be part of the sustainability solution. So that's that kind of first tier. That second, uh, the second tier beneath that are a, range, uh, are a suite of nine strategies, as we're calling it, and they're kind of bucketed onto each, each of those pillars. Um, and I'll explain them in a little bit more detail, but I'll just kind of introduce the titles of each of, each of them, just because it might be a little bit difficult to read. The first one we're calling Transitioning to a Renewable Energy Future. Makes sense, right? Um, the second one is Embracing Our Californian Climate, which is really to do with our currently unsustainable patterns of water consumption in San Jose. Um, the third, 2.1, is really about densifying our city to accommodate our future neighbors, again alluding to that growth that I was talking about. 2.2 is making our homes efficient and affordable for our families. 2.3 is creating clean, personalized mobility choices. 2.4 is developing integrated, accessible public transport infrastructure. 3.1 is creating local jobs in our city to reduce vehicle miles traveled, and I'll explain a little bit what that, what that term and what that phrase means. 3.2 is improving our commercial building stock, and 3.3 is making commercial goods movements um, clean and efficient in our city. Now, those sound like kind of cute words on a page, but behind each of those strategies are a range of um, sustainability actions and modeling that has gone into understanding what are the actual technologies, policies, and behavior which are going to move the needle and deliver carbon benefits uh, and water benefits. The section be uh, below that is what we're calling uh, playbooks, which is this section here. And what that really is is tailored readouts to key um, stakeholder groups in the city, you know, from residents to the business community to regional agencies, 
um, that explain how they can help implement the plan. So if that top section of this picture is really about the what, what are you doing? The bottom section is really about the who and the how. And the purpose of those tailored play, uh, playbooks are really to give a focus set of recommendations to uh, you know, various types of uh, uh, stakeholder groups on what they can do to implement that plan. And then supported by that is this kind of red level underneath that, and we've called that the enabling role of City Hall. And there's a range of stances that the City Hall as an administration, as, as a local government can take, all the way from kind of um, you know, convening the right kinds of conversations on the other end of the spectrum to working with the community to implement specific programs to generate um, and deliver carbon emissions. So we kind of see the role of City Hall as central to helping activate various other groups in the city to, to make this change. And then that kind of um, fuchsia colored banner at the bottom, we're calling bold campaigns. And the reason why we included that is you, you might be tempted to look at each of those nine strategies in isolation. You might think, yeah, I want to do a little bit of strategy 2.1 and you know, all of strategy 2.3. It doesn't really work like that. Um, a lot of these strategies are interconnected. So for example, if you're uh, focusing growth, um, such as by, you know, uh, by developing urban villages, that goes hand in hand with having clean and sustainable and accessible public transit options. So the reason why we in uh, included these bold campaigns is a means to kind of force the cohesive nature of these strategies to come together. And so just exploring each of those nine strategies one by one in a little bit more detail, um, strategy 1.1 is, is uh, transitioning to a renewable energy future. And I mentioned at the, at the start of the presentation that you know, one of the biggest, biggest successes of San Jose was the approval to go ahead with San Jose Clean Energy, its Community Choice Energy Program. That does a lot for, um, for reducing emissions in San Jose um, by giving ownership and giving the rights for what the uh, power mix ought to look like in San Jose to its residents. It allows San Jose to accelerate the rate at which renewables forms part of its energy mix um, at a rate that is greater than the already very high rate that California is doing it at. So what that allows is, to, is for energy supplies in the city to, uh, uh, what that allows is for the wide scale development of renewable energy uh, solutions in the cities. And that can be done through incorporating feeding tariffs um, and other kind of incentives that can be used so that small local power providers uh, you know, rooftop solar applications can be fed into that mix. And we see that as very important to unlocking other strategies. When we're talking about the electric electrification of transport, that's also important. And when you electrify transport and green the grid at the same time, you get synergistic benefits as a result of that. Strategy 1.2 I mentioned is about water. It's about water use. Um, you might well know that, and that, that San Jose is in a very kind of arid part of California, and its pattern of water use depends heavily on imported water from the, from you know, um, Hetch Hetchy and other parts of California. So when we're talking about water, the easiest and kind of best recourse to enabling a sustainable supply is actually being mindful about how we use water. So this strategy is very deliberate in looking at what are the residential and commercial drivers that can be used to uh, reduce water consumption. That's everything from you know, passive infrared sensors in the home to persuading residents of San Jose that uh, a low water use, um, you know, zeriscaped front yard can actually be pretty attractive and native and um, authentic to the, the culture and the feel of San Jose. So although you know, we've been talking about kind of carbon emissions, that you know, strategy 1.2 is really about kind of water and how that uh, relates as part of the broader Climate Smart San Jose solution. Strategy 2.1, densify our city to accommodate our future neighbors. Uh, I alluded to that, you know, the city's population is expected to increase significantly in the future. And you might think that this would, you know, if you did nothing, this would be terrible news for a city. You know, you're already unsustainable, for example, and you're going to, uh, add additional population and worsen the problem. That would be the conventional thinking. Climate Smart San Jose actually turns that on its head and says that for every new resident that you bring into the city or that is born in the city, 
that person can actually have a climate smart lifestyle uh, in terms of how you choose to house that person, what kind of options you give that person in terms of how they move about the city in terms of transit, um, and the sustainable choices that they're able to make. And so strategy 2.1 talks about densifying our city in focused growth areas of which there are about 68 outlined in the general plan um, to really bring people together and make places in San Jose, make, uh, make these urban villages not just as this kind of, you know, uh, uh, these, you know, earmark zones of development, but as vibrant cultural centers where people can live close to where they work, uh, live close to where they need to access amenities and go to grocery stores, and, and live close to where they send their kids to school. So there's a real kind of um, uh, importance here in, there's, there's a real importance here in densifying our cities to reduce vehicle miles travel, which is the need for and the dependency that people have on their cars to, and to go out and, and consume gasoline. Strategy 2.2 is making homes efficient and affordable for our families. And that's probably, when you think of sustainability, you know, and what you can do as individuals, that's probably where your mind goes in the first place in terms of the efficiency improvements you can make to you know, your building envelope, whether that's putting insulation in your loft or including LED lighting in your homes. Um, what we talk about in Strategy 2.2 is making homes efficient in San Jose through a combination of retrofits and also by looking at zero net energy homes uh, for new buildings and new residential development that comes online in the city to accommodate that future growth. Strategy 2.3 is about creating clean, personalized mobility choices. So there's a lot of excitement about you know, electric vehicles, shared autonomous electric vehicles, and all the rest of it. And that really needs to be considered as a part of a broader agenda of reducing vehicle miles traveled, which is the term that you use for uh, describing um, the, the, the distance that is traveled by one you know, fossil fuel consuming vehicle. And when we look at San Jose's footprint, that is a key driver of its carbon emissions. So the, to the extent that we can look at clean, personalized mobility choices, um, uh, that can help reduce uh, San Jose's carbon, carbon picture as well. That again goes hand in hand with strategy 2.4, which is developing integrated accessible public transit. So we create, we densify a city, we create walkable neighborhoods that are pleasant to live in. We want to serve those communities with high quality and accessible public transit that is safe, right? We want people to be able to move around in the city. We want people to be able to leave their car at home and get on a bus. And so that strategy is around how we can uh, take the improvements that are planned through BART, through high speed rail in the future, through the VTA's next network, and other uh, public transit programs uh, in the pipeline to help piece that as part of our decarbonization st uh, strategy. Strategy 3.1 is about creating local jobs. Um, so you might wonder why we're talking about local jobs in a sustainability plan, and it really works in much the same way as when we talk about focused growth. And the reason is, you know, I mentioned that a large part of our carbon footprint is to do with, you know, uh, with travel, with mobility. It's about 55% of San Jose's carbon footprint is to do with vehicle use. And a large part of that is to do with people driving to where they work. And like I mentioned, a lot of people live in San Jose but work elsewhere. And so creating local jobs is a solution to reduce the need for, you know, for people to be stuck on the 101, on the 280, uh, and to be able to live close to where they work, reduce the need of, uh, for dependency on the car, and in so doing, reduce the amount of gasoline that's being consumed, and therefore reduce carbon emissions. So we feel that this is a, a nice kind of um, overlay with how climate change will also help deliver economic development benefits as well. 3.2 is improving our commercial building stock. And that's to say that, you know, if we're asking residents in San Jose to make improvements in their homes by, imp by including efficiency upgrades, we can also ask the private sector and the commercial enterprises to do the same. San Jose is home to a lot of data centers and technology companies that use a lot of electricity. And um, part of Climate Smart San Jose is having a conversation with um, each of those, if, with that sector of society and thinking about how we can scale energy efficiency solutions and look at the adoption of renewable energy. Some of the biggest renewable energy plays in the country are made by the private sector, such as uh, Walmart and Google. And so how can we bring some of that to San Jose? And then the final one, which is making commercial goods move, uh, movement clean and efficient. Um, that again is, you know, 
when you look at the footprint of San Jose, a large part of that is to do with the movement of goods you know, through the city. And you might think as a resident of San Jose, there's not much that you personally can do about that, but the city is, you know, it, it has commercial and industrial enterprises which operate and, uh, and work outside of San Jose. And what we have called for in Climate Smart San Jose is to have, again, a conversation with how we can make, sustain, uh, how we can make goods movement in the city more sustainable, whether that's you know, the uh, heavy-duty truck that's um, you know, transporting pipes or whether that's your Amazon delivery vehicle, which is idling outside to drop your Amazon box off. So these solutions really need to be seen as kind of a complete holistic set of interrelated strategies that help together drive down emissions in the city. And I mentioned that you know, we had done and we had conducted a lot of analysis and modeling to understand the reduction potentials for each of those, uh, each of those strategies. And so you know, we have nine relatively simplistically worded strategies, but really underneath that we have these 53 measures which we've uh, which we've analyzed to, to get us there. And what I mean by analysis is, you know, we don't just look at the benefits in terms of, you know, how much carbon is a measure saving. We look at the cost of that as well. And it, it's important that we, you know, consider this because we're able to make a, you know, a sober appraisal as to the true costs of sustainability in the city. So what that means is we've looked at um, solutions such as, you know, renewable energy in this kind of yellow section here. We've, look, we've looked at energy efficiency improvements that can be made, the electrification of buildings, so switching out natural gas in favor of electric alternatives, um, things that you can do in the home, such as smart thermostats, uh, ground source heat pumps, uh, thermal envelope retrofits in the commercial sector, um, you know, uh, efficiency upgrade in data centers. And then we've also looked at the mobility section here. So we looked at, you know, when we talked about clean, uh, personalized mobility choices, we talk about the interrelationship between electric vehicles. You know, some fraction of that in the future might be shared. Um, some fraction of that in the future might be autonomous as well. And how do those work together to um, reduce vehicle miles traveled and re reduce the gasoline consumption that's used in the city? And then similarly, as I mentioned, we looked at public transport and we've looked at some of the key infrastructure upgrades that are, um, that are being planned. And we've looked at, you know, if we were to extend this, it's kind of logical conclusion, what kind of, how many cars could we take off the road if we expanded, you know, the VTA's next network, or we looked at what that would do for BART? And how can we make sure that we uh, design Climate Smart San Jose in such a way that incorporates the benefits that each of these initiatives are undertaking? And then finally here, what we have are these um, the water reducing uh, actions which are also part of Climate Smart San Jose. So the reason we have done this, like I say, is to look at the full kind of economic costs and benefits of climate action. And we look at, we look at the marginal benefits in particular. And what I mean by that is, let's say you own a vehicle, a Hyundai or something like that, and you know, that, that costs you, let's say, $20,000 per year. And you're looking at the marginal cost, you're looking at the cost of electric vehicle what you want to do is look at how much more an electric vehicle, whether that's a, you know, a, a, a Tesla Model 3 or something else, costs you relative to the car that you would otherwise have. And that concept of marginality is important because it takes into account that people in the city are already going to make choices with regard to what they purchase in terms of living sustainability. They're going to choose one particular home, um, and they have a choice between that home is, you know, as it's currently built, and a home that is more sustainable, that has a lot of kind of green and sustainable features involved. So we looked at the concept of marginality to figure out how much more is this going to cost um, the city of San Jose as an economy, and how much is this going to save the city of San Jose as an economy as well? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do that? Okay, should we jump to Kuna? Okay. Um, so, you can stay up here if you want. Sorry. 
Yeah. All right, you join me. Um, so that was the, the plan and kind of the, what's inside of the plan. What is um, important is around implementation. So the, the city clearly plays a role, everything from partnering to convening to using its influence, um, setting policy, but it's by no means, um, it's, it's necessary but insufficient in order to be able to get there. Oops, where are we? Um, do you want to go straight to Q and A? All right. So one of the things that's really critical is a lot of the technologies um, that are implemented in the plan are in their early stages. So this is a classic model of adoption. So it just follows any particular technology as it moves through a population. So as an example, a you know a early adopter or early adopter. Uh, Technology would be EVs or solar panels, things like that. A laggard technology or the laggard population would is say microwaves or cars. It's, it's basically ubiquitous, everyone has one. Most of the technologies and measures that we see are in that early adopter phase. So the question is becomes, how do you more rapidly scale these uh, sustainability measures in order to meet the challenge at hand? And a way to think about this is this idea of uh, a network activation. So what is a network? A network is any community that we interact with in our daily lives. And we are surrounded by networks. In fact, we interact with multiple uh, networks in any given day. So we have networks of where we like to play or see sports like the sharks or the earthquakes. Um, we have online networks such as Facebook. We have places where we shop. Uh, our homes and, and how we finance our homes. And you can think of these as starting to put together these different networks in order to be able to drive messaging around sustainability. So this is an exciting area because it lends itself to a lot of creativity and a way to be able to use the great organizations that exist in San Jose from nonprofits to technology companies to community institutions, um, the whole gamut of the San Jose community to come up with new partnerships to drive different actions. So I'll give you an example, which is, you know, the show, what's the show called? Fixer Upper. So imagine Fixer Upper did a San Jose show and it profiles them and they're working on their home. And Home Depot does a target, so the local Home Depot actually has the materials and promotion campaign on the, on the uh, materials in order to do those type of uh, green upgrades. And you could see it taken even further of the local banks actually finance some of those upgrades. But the idea is that there are partnerships trying to drive towards a common change, in this case, upgrading uh, a home to more energy efficient or water efficient measures um, to be able to, to meet that outcome. So that is something we've started to, to think about in this program to move through the adoption curve more quickly. One of the areas to get started on this is the playbook. So we created a playbook for residents, for businesses, and this is a place where you can literally rip it out if you want or print it out on the, from the plan and actually has a guide about what are the most impactful actions that you can take. So this is different than many other sort of just checklists of things that you can do, like change CFL bulb, light bulbs, but more about what are the high impact measures that you can take. So for instance, you know, if you're looking at moving, living close to transit or in a transit oriented development is a really great way to be able to not only reduce carbon, but also improves your quality of life. So there are a lot of these, um, or there's a handful of these measures that are laid out in these, uh, in these playbooks. And then there's also, of course, agencies as well and recommendations for agencies in terms of policies to be able to adopt. That is in the plan uh, as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ashwini. Yeah. Thank you. So it didn't quite make the half hour, but um, just closing uh, in terms of next steps. So we are scheduled to go to council for, uh, for consideration of this plan on February 27th. So we hope to see many of you there as well. Love to, council would love to hear from you. Um, we we um, will be, you know, uh, if council uh, gives us the go ahead on the plan, uh, we hope to advance implementation on certain priorities that we've called out in the plan. 
and again, assuming council buy-in on those, uh, it's essential that we really engage the community, as you heard that theme throughout the plan, um, to build awareness and then also to activate networks through the community. Uh, fundraising and partnerships is going to be another key aspect. So this is, again, not a city hall-led plan. It's not about city hall taking actions or mandating things. Um, so there's going to be sort of strategic partnerships that we have to enter into, as well as fundraising. One example of a partnership we're hoping to enter into soon after the adoption of the plan is to look at um, natural and working lands and kind of quantify the benefits, um, whether it's through sequestration or other considerations, and really build on that, so like a phase two of the plan. And we've been working closely with a lot of those advocates. Um, and then uh, it's going to be really important to see how we're doing. It is a live document. It's not something that we're going to adopt, and then it just you know, sits on a shelf, and those are the goals we uh, try to meet. We're going to constantly have to check in, see how we're doing, if a strategy is working or not, um, and kind of other things that may be happening uh, in the context of uh, other plans and things going on in the city. How are we keeping up with technology? Where we made assumptions about technology advancing, where it doesn't, we kind of have to kind of relook at our path forward. And so it's going to be really important for us to make sure we're making progress and communicate that progress through dashboards. Uh, we're planning on, at least in the, at the start of the implementation, semi-annual updates to council. And then we also hope to, again, because of the close connection to the general plan, really hope to update this plan in alignment with the four-year updates of the general plan. And so with that, I think we're going to be ready for questions. Um, I do want to, again, make sure that anybody viewing us um, on live stream, please email your questions to cssj at sanjoseca.gov. And in addition to that, uh, please check out our website, uh, Climate Smart San Jose. And that's, uh, do we have, uh, we may have it up there. Yeah, so there's our website. Um, sjenvironment.org slash CSSJ. So you can review the plan in full. We also have an executive summary if the full plan is a little too much of time commitment. And we'd love to get your feedback. Just in the last couple of days since we've posted the plan, we've got uh, more than 30 people sort of commenting, and some of them really kind of long emails, which we very much appreciate. Um, this is something... You know, we've put everything you, I mean, we went way over because you can tell that everybody's very enthusiastic about this and we've put a lot into it and hoping to kind of get everybody, you know, on board with us as well. So with that, I'll open it up for uh, Q&A. Thank you so much. And I think we're gonna have um, Jenny and, do we have two mics or just one? Okay, so Aaron and Jenny are just gonna be walking up and down the aisles. On. Thank you. Um, in October, the City Council approved $75,000 of additional work on a, for an open space and agricultural lands component to be added to this plan, but it's not in the plan. And given that uh, Council approval is expected to be in seven days, that means you're not giving us any opportunity to re review that component of the plan. Uh, what's up with that? Um, so uh, you're right, council did give us some additional money to explore uh, natural and working lands. Um, the money was not just for that though, it was also for additional work that was being done by PwC on the document itself. We did spend a lot of time with um, uh, folks from um, OSA, uh, Committee for Green Foothills and others to kind of look at, if you, just taking a step back, we talked about the fact that this plan was really based on data, and we were looking at sort of what were the ways we could really impact emissions. As we had more conversations, what became obvious is it's definitely an area that we'd like to explore, but there wasn't enough quantifiable data for us to put that in the plan. If you look at sort of 
sequestration by itself, that wasn't enough to include in the plan as one of the measures, which is why we've specifically put in the recommendations to council that we want to do as soon as the plan is adopted. We want to do additional kind of partner with a few folks built on the work that the state was doing. So that was also something underway. So it was uncertain kind of what was going to come out of their analysis. So work on that, work with our partners on funding as well as scope and then uh, bring something back for council consideration. Again, we plan for frequent updates, so we will bring back, and what we're hoping is that through that um, research and sort of partnership, we'll be able to bring forward some quantifiable um, analysis on the connection of, of natural and working lands to emissions, so not just sequestration, but other considerations, and then really inform council decision making in the future, not just about this plan, but about any other decisions they take in terms of the general plan, where you know where projects would be cited. So it could inform a lot of different decisions by council, but we really need to bring it forward. We need to bring forward recommendations based on data. Hi, I'm wondering if the board is aware that the uh, Cal Air Board has uh, put forth the uh, finding that within a year and a half to 2020, gas lawn tools will pol be polluting our air in California more than automobiles. Is anybody aware of that? Sam, do you want to take that? Yeah, so when we're developing the plan, the, the number to remember is 6.9 million tons of carbon in the, ci in the city of San Jose each year. And as we were developing the plan and looking to understand what actually supports that number, um, the gas lawn tools, uh, we didn't have enough data on that to, uh, to be able to identify that, that this was a material contributor to that. But as Ashwini says, the plan is a living document, and as more data becomes available, which demonstrates that you know, other, there are other emission sources that we need to consider, that can definitely be brought into the fold. And I think that's primarily due to two cycle motors used in many of the lawn tools. Uh, Two-cycle uh, motorcycles have been banned from our roads since the 1970s, and I'd, I'd like to see a phase-out of two-cycle lawn tools because electrified lawn tools are readily available. And that's very much in alignment with the whole electrification strategy, and I don't know if any of you have uh, seen the SPUR document that they put out, too, in terms of fossil-free Bay Area, uh, which is, again, you know, kind of really look at it's two-pronged, right? You electrify and then make sure all, it's coming from renewable and clean sources. So, Check. Hi, my name is Nassim Nouri. I'm a county council with the Green Party of Santa Clara County. Uh, you would think that I'd be delighted to have this plan take place, and I am to a certain degree. I'm a bit uh, dismayed, actually, but by what the plan includes at this late stage and also how little time the public has to review the extent of the details you've provided. Uh, there was a mention that there's going to be some uh, metrics uh, shared with us. Is that something you plan to do later today or are there milestones, metrics, very specific uh, goals and standards that the plan has outlined to reach uh, just like the green vision had. Uh, quite a lot of that seems to be missing from even a lot of the input that you've already received on uh, in the many meetings that you've had. Uh, so there are metrics. If you look at each strategy in the plan, um, there's kind of targets for different timelines. So some that are as quick as 2021, but then most of them are 2030, 2040, and 2050. And that's sort of the, the trajectory, right, the goals that we have to hit. But again, as we talked, I mean, this is, this is a big lift. The green vision was fairly focused, and it was really a lot of it was sort of internal city hall, like, you know, our fleet or kind of trails we build. This is going to be a big lift on the part of the entire community and also making a lot of assumptions about how technology is going to help us, right? So we have put in targets. Uh, when I talked about sort of sharing metrics, right, what, what, 
I'm talking about is we've kind of laid out targets. We will be creating dashboards you'll see in the plan, and I'm not sure if we have a page number, if we can give that for the dashboard. So those are the metrics we're planning to track our progress on. Um, and it's, it covers the entire sort of spectrum of strategies, the nine strategies that we talked about. And um, we, we, through our uh, semi-annual updates to council, we'll be sharing those as well as making, those, uh, making the dashboard public on, uh, on our website. We're actually looking at a possible partnership with Stanford to help us sort of create some of the data and the dashboards. Um, because that's something that's not in the scope of PwC's work, but that's the next step. So the detail that's already in the, sorry, the detail that's already in the plan is all the public is going to see and all the city hall, uh, our city council is going to see before approving the plan? The, that's correct. The, oh. the one that's already in the release plan, right? Right, that's yeah, I read through it. Yes. And yeah, it didn't seem like it was nearly as actually complete as uh, the Green Vision. That, that's what I was asking about. So that's the level of detail that any of us are going to see before it's approved, right? That, that's correct. Uh, there's a technical appendix, which is the supporting document. But if you look at, and um, we hope to post that pretty soon. Um, but that's just sort of the backup of the entire, so all of the modeling that went into it and all of the assumptions that went into it. Ashwini, can I just add something? So uh, the metrics that we've outlined in each of the strategies um, are internally consistent with each other. And what we mean by that is that if you look at the metrics from one particular strategy, let's say around focus growth of our city, the, that particular, particular number um, is linked to uh, the metrics in another strategy, such as public transit ridership. So what that means is we haven't pulled these metrics out of thin air and said that feels like a good number. I think, I think we could reach that. That is an internally consistent mathematical relationship. If you achieve this particular metric, we'll also achieve the other. And that's what's different about this plan to uh, our previous work as well. Hi, the, uh, you mentioned a number to remember. It strikes me the number to remember is 264 billion, as in 264 billion dollars that this plan is purported to cost. That's a stupefying number. Everybody that I've discussed it with thought it was a typo. Hmm. Amazingly, you have presented this plan for 50 minutes without ever mentioning the costs, let alone the purported financial benefits, which don't hold water. Building on the woman who just, uh, the comments of the woman who just spoke, the plan document is remarkably thin in talking about those costs or where those financial benefits might come from. So what are the approval processes that are gonna happen, presumably after next week, because it sounds like this is largely a statement of intent, to approve each and every cost that the city's gonna undertake, because of course the vast majority of those costs are not gonna be on the city's budget, even though the costs that are going to be on the city's budget vastly outweigh, near as I can tell, what we spend on, let's say, public safety. The majority of those costs are going to be foisted upon we taxpayers in the city of San Jose and the private sector. There needs to be checks and balances. There needs to be approval at the ballot box by the, by the citizens of San Jose. And it'd be interesting to hear what the plan is for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, and I'll, I'll let Sean expand. I mean, of course, yes, that, that's a very large number, and Sean will sort of get into what are the assumptions that go into the number. Uh, there's the costs, and then there's also the cost savings, right, which are almost, um, those are both outlined in the plan. Um, in terms of approval actions, again, this is a more of a strategy document, right? It kind of lays out the pathways to get us to where we want to go in terms of emissions. But each of those strategies would require a lot of different actions if it were the city undertaking certain actions. So if it's a policy that the uh, city council needs to approve, that will go through its usual sort of vetting process, whether it requ requires community engagement, uh, requires CEQA, go, you know, and goes to city council for approval, generally goes to council committees for approval as well, and all of those get noticed. So um, it is, again, it's, it's a big lift. Uh, if you're looking for the kind of uh, detail that I'm getting, you know, sensing from your questions, it's not meant to do that. It is, it's got a lot of robust analysis behind it, 
but each of those um, strategies will require a lot of work and actions moving forward and there will be an approval process that's very public. And Sean, you want to talk about the costs? Yeah, I just want to make the distinction in terms of how we talk about costs. Um, we have in Climate Smart San Jose computed the economic costs, and that's different to the financial costs. So what that means is we're looking at the economic value of each of these actions. So if you're somebody who chooses to buy, uh, let's say you have a $30,000 electric vehicle multiplied by 500,000 people in the city buying those vehicles, you, you suddenly ramp up to about $16 billion in terms of the economic cost of doing that. That's not a financial cost, and it, but that means is it's not a cost that is attributed to an individual entity, whether that's the city hall or whether that's the private sector. Um, and for context, you know, the, the GDP of the San Jose and uh, of San, the city of San Jose is something about $180 billion per year. So $264 billion over, uh, over the next 40 years um, is, uh, I think, works out to about 2.6% of the city's GDP over that, over that time. On the other hand, as Ashwini mentioned, we've also computed the benefits of that, and the benefits are avoided fossil fuel consumption um, or avoided um, um, fossil fuel consumption and generation from power plants, as a for instance. And that works out to about 2.4% of the city's GDP using the same mathematics. So the net cost that we're talking about is 0.2% of the city's GDP between now and 2050. And that's not a, that's an economic cost and not a financial cost. Thank you. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Magically, the savings in the document actually claim that it's gonna be a net positive, but it, it all comes across, pardon my expression, as high flute and poppycock, that, that to do it over, and it's 32 years, that your plan, uh, the, the question is how much cost, hard costs are going to be mandated on individuals and or on the city government. And for savings, hard dollar savings, not soft dollar savings mm -hmm. that, uh, or, or soft savings that will not come back to the individuals or businesses or the city of San Jose. Okay. That, thank you for your question, and we'll try to ma make it clearer through our council presentation and address that specifically. Thank you. Uh, so I will just take a moment to say as a resident and a homeowner in San Jose, I am more than willing to pay my fair share to provide this future for myself and future generations. Um, although I am curious about any specific strategies for the fundraising and getting private partnerships, not only looking at the city's deficit and our, the city's ability to lead as well as get our residents to adopt programs, but also based on the fact that the tech companies, which are a huge source of wealth in this area, were noticeably absent from any flood um, relief efforts last year in the cities, Facebook, Google, Adobe, who is based in San Jose. So what are the plans to try to actually make those efforts amount to real dollars? Uh, great question. We'd, we'd love to um, sort of leverage all of the wealth that is in this area. Um, we have started discussions uh, with um, folks that are kind of leading the UN Sustainability Development Goals uh, implementation, and they uh, do access a partnership with them and kind of looking at specific things related to Climate Smart San Jose, uh, we are hoping would lead to some funding partnerships, but those are more philanthropic partnerships, so not about the tech. I mean, that the tech sector definitely in this area is something we, we need to leverage, whether it's through partnerships on technology or actual hard dollars invested um, into implementation of this plan. And we do have a um, council's approved a, um, a person, you know, chief sustainability officer st starting pretty soon. We're in the recruiting process um, to specifically lead the implementation of the plan. And when I talk about, I mean, the implementation is going to be across departments across the city, but really to kind of provide that focus of fundraising and then the community engagement piece, right? As um, a director likes to say, you know, evangelizing, right? Like how do you get people on board and then how do you fundraise? Because without that, 
we are not planning on spending any general fund dollars on the implementation of this plan. Um, unless it's something that's already supporting a city priority infrastructure that's kind of planned. So uh, the, the plan was actually funded um, through a, a the challenge, the, uh, an energy efficiency challenge that we uh, won an award of $1.25 million from PG&E. And that's the money that's being uh, used to fund the development of this plan, as well as this person who's going to be starting pretty soon. And so we, we are very much, we're not, this is not something we're planning to kind of pit against all of the many needs the city already has and um, that are always competing for general fund dollars. And so it's going to be absolutely essential to get funding and to enter into partnerships to, to implement a lot, of the, a lot of the initiatives that are called out for in here. And so how we're gonna do it exactly, I don't have that answer for you. We know that's one of our priorities and as soon as the person starts, they're gonna be out there sort of engaging, right? They're not doing the work within City Hall. A lot of the departments are uh, responsible for different things, but they're the ones that are gonna be out there kind of fundraising and you know partnering. And if you have any ideas, any of you here, on how we can make connections to activate that community network, we'd love to hear. Ashwin, do you have any questions from um, the email? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't have any, but you can, you can give me some. I did want to get back on the dashboard pages. It's one page, pages 150 and 151 of the plan. Uh, we had an email asking whether... Um, um, gas leaf blowers were considered as part of the plan. Sean, did you want to tackle that? Yes, was that the gentleman who asked the question previously, perhaps? Um, oh, again, okay, okay. Oh. great. Well, okay. I think it's great that they're supporting the community for that, but you know, as I said previously, I think um, you know, we developed this plan based on what we knew and what we modeled that would materially change the city's carbon emissions profile, and as and when we get more data, um, that can that additional work can be kind of released in, in subsequent iterations of the plan. Hello, uh, this question is for PwC regarding your network diagram that you had produced in your presentation. Specifically, I noticed that you had a segment on the right side relating to Uber and Lyft regarding ride sharing. My question to you is regarding the integration of car sharing, uh, specifically when it came to stakeholders and the concept of uh, inclusivity that were you were mentioning earlier on in your presentation, how do you hope to tackle inclusivity regarding car sharing in San Jose as part of your playbook and as part of involvement of stakeholders? Yeah. Okay. So sorry, just to, can you just quickly <laughs> no worries. repeat uh, your question? I, it was, yeah. I was actually very curious because in your network diagram you had mentioned Uber and Lyft. Yep. So the concept of car sharing and the concept of inclusivity to me sounds like they contrast a little bit and I was curious to see or hear from you how you plan to integrate the concept of inclusivity and car sharing in your playbook as recommendations or as policies. Yeah, so the, in the network the idea with, with the car sharing was to be able to promote um, not, not just single hail rides, but actually community rides. So getting more than one, you know, one passenger in the car uh, to be able to do that. So there were some, and the, the network activation is really just to illustrate an idea, but an idea was what if, uh, say, Starbucks or a local coffee vendor teamed up and provided vouchers for coffees with people who had car share, as an, an example, to be able to promote that kind of behavior. Um, so that's one of, you know, I'm sure hundreds of ideas that come, come in, but the idea is really how can we uh, take good behaviors that are happening today that are in alignment with what needs to be done around carbon and also the good life and be able to amplify them in the community by um, touching on these different networks. And, and, and just in terms of kind of the contribution of car sharing to Climate Smart San Jose, um, there's been great work done by um, UC Berkeley looking at the effects of car sharing. And they say something like, you can take nine cars off the road for every car shared vehicle. And just because of, if you have the right kind of density and if you have the right kind of commercial model. So including that on the side is not, um, you know, we are not kind of conferring any kind of credence or credibility on Uber or Lyft or any specific companies, but mm -hmm. the concept of ride sharing, how that is generated. Great. 
Thank you. We had another uh, email come in. Uh, this is from Todd Weber. He's, he said, uh, I've recently freed up my schedule and I'm planning to be able to focus on helping climate change improvement and recovery efforts. I'm a San Jose resident. How do I begin to engage? That's, that's a great uh, question. Uh, would love to get more of those. Um, so definitely the playbooks would be a place to start. Um, I think the other, the other part that I would say kind of si sign up, you know, to get updates and we'll be sure to reach out and let you know when we're actually starting any kind of community focus group, uh, of, you know, kind of centered around certain strategies. Uh, like I mentioned, when the new person comes on board, um, and again, they're um, at a deputy director level, so um, uh, uh, we were able to get somebody that was, um, you know, that council felt like this is something we really need to invest in and got a pretty high-level management position to lead this effort across the city. So uh, once they're on board, we... We really want to kick off sort of that, um, you know, how, how do we engage from all across the city, um, whether it's uh, residents, it's, um, you know, uh, labor groups, businesses, um, other nonprofits, and uh, figure out a way to kind of keep them engaged through, through various groups. So we'll be uh, sure to be in touch. Uh, I think if they sign up, they'll get updates, right, if they sign up through um, SJ Environment. That's right. If they go to the website uh, up there, sjenvironment.org, CSSJ, they can sign up for to get uh, regular email updates. Great. Great. Um, I wanted to ask another question about inclusivity. Um, it seems to me that the most power that this this plan would have is if it if it if it creates an opening or an opportunity for the community to really take ownership for this and to not have it be, well, it's really the city offices that are running the project and everybody else is just functioning as an individual, you know, right. policy, you know, adopter or something like that as an individual. But, it, but the, the, the community and all the different sectors can be part of, collectively, the whole community owning it. And it, and it seems to me that it would be easy for the city to say, well, we are good at administering things, so we'll just kind of run it. But it, so the question is inclusivity. You know, if it's, if it's for the community to own it, how do you find the balance between the tension of the community engaging, like with the substance of it, and not just as individuals, but collectively and together, versus the city saying, well, but we can manage it better. It'll get too chaotic if we give away the reins. It needs to be some balancing of those things so, so that the, the, this, this, this undertaking can catch fire, yes. that the community can come alive and be empowered by it. And, and I mean, all uh, the businesses, you say, right. well, we haven't exactly figured out how businesses are going to get involved. You certainly can't send them a bill. So they're not going to get involved if they see a way that can work for them, that is honorable for them. Similarly, with all the other sectors, and I haven't, I didn't see that in the plan. It's like it's a city project, and the city got it done, and here's the plan, and what do you think? And you can individually have comments. Well, here's mine. <laughs> okay, that's really helpful feedback because that is exactly the vision. And if that hasn't come across, whether through the plan or the presentation, we obviously need to go back and kind of figure out how we're going to make that clear because. I think Sean touched upon this, but it is not a city plan. We will have, the city will have a certain roles to play, right? So we will implement certain things because those are actions only the city can take. But the vast majority, we're going to be convening, we're going to be facilitating, we're going to be enabling. So that is our role. I mean, we cannot do this. It's, it's just too big a lift, right? And we don't want to do it. I mean, it is not the appropriate way to do it. Um, I actually see a lot of opportunity for businesses to get involved, right? As we're talking, I think, uh, Trip or Sean, one of you talked about the whole, like, the home improvement uh, fixer-upper edition, right? And, and um, to me, as we look at how we're going to build, what kind of improvements are we going to make in terms of energy, in terms of water, 
transit, I mean, there is a huge opportunity for businesses to be involved, whether they are on the end of sort of coming up with technology or they are building things, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. And um, I think engaging sort of and catalyzing community groups to around certain things, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole, like everybody is kind of coming together and doing their parts um, where they can contribute the most to make this happen. I mean, we get really excited with this vision of what we're thinking this could take us to 30 years from now. Um, how we, we could be living as a community that's, um, you know, sort of cleaner, greener, but also much happier, like in terms of the choices they're making. But it's definitely not a city hall initiative. So we will make sure to kind of bring that out where we see the roles of different sectors in, in you know, of the community. So do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think just to double down on the idea that this plan doesn't work if it's not inclusive, because, you know, the city can't go around forcing you to, you know, buy a Tesla, right, or to take public transit or to, you know, fix up your home. It can't force you to do any of that. But by being smart with coming up with asymmetric and oblique solutions, it can work with let's say Home Depot, for an example, to come up with a promotion for Labor Day weekend that gives you a discount on a bunch of items that allows you to go and you know, put loft insulation in your home. Or it can, when it rezones and works with the VTA on where buses go, it can choose to decide to bus stop near where you live. So th when we're thinking about you know, how the city can, uh, can do that, the, the role of the city is really looking to work and collaborate with community groups and kind of be inclusive, and be just because of the physical reality that the city can't force you to do any of those things. And, and I just wanted to add, one of the things we kind of shared with uh, PwC too at the start is this was not a plan where we were gonna be like mandating things all the time and banning things and you know, that was not what, it was meant to be about being in a better place, you know, the good life. It wasn't about sort of starting to just regulate everything. So that was not the objective. And yet, that's how things so often end up. Um, my question uh, along those lines, and I think it touches on inclusivity too, is uh, about residential retrofit electrification. Uh, when I moved into my house, um, at the time, the environmentally correct thing to do was go to gas because it was, you know, less environmentally impactful than coal. And so we put in a gas dryer. And now I see in this that, you know, boy, we'd really like it if that dryer was electric. And your stove, and your heater, your water heater, your furnace. So I, I have a couple questions about this. First off, how, have you, how do you see those residential electro retrofits going down? Is that something that is mandated? Is that something that's at time of sale? Is that something that we just, you cannot install a new gas you know, furnace in San Jose anymore? How do you see that going down? And my second question is, is, you know, it's, it's a hard argument to tell me, hey, you know, you need to go to a, an electric stove when that electricity is being generated by gas being burnt in, in uh, Coyote Valley. And, and additionally, in, in addition to where the energy itself is coming from, there are deep costs associated with retrofit. You know, the, the sheet metal and parts for a new furnace and a new stove, those, those all have their own carbon footprint, as does their installation and all that. And I'm just wondering how deep the analysis of uh, the cost-benefit on this goes and how you see those residential electric retrofits actually playing out in the real world. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. And I, I'm going to get it started, and then maybe, Sean, you can get into the numbers and assumptions a little bit. So... Um, when we look at residential retrofits, one of the big opportunities we see is San Jose Clean Energy, which is that community choice aggregation, um, you know, that council approved and that we hope to launch this year. That is one of the biggest opportunities for this plan. Without that, I'm not sure we would have quite been able to get to where we wanted to go. So we do not see it, 
our vision is not to mandate to force people to kind of get out of their you know uh, existing gas furnaces and go to electric or existing um, gas stoves and go to electric right so it's not it's not a mandate like by this date you have to do this what we are thinking of is there's all kinds of opportunities with san jose clean energy where we want to try and the energy that we're sourcing want to get that to be more and more clean right like uh, uh, by 2021 100 percent carbon free right, GHG free. That's not all renewable, but GHG free. So it's clean energy. So that's your source. Then the opportunity is when you look at the numbers, when we did the business plan for San Jose Clean Energy, the, you know, with the revenues coming in, right, there, there is some, when, when you do cost projections, I mean, there is some amount of money that you can use for different programs to kind of support uh, you know, priorities for San Jose Clean Energy. So one of the things could be you provide incentives for retrofits because, again, now they're going to use more electricity, so it helps the utility, right, instead of gas. But then they can provide incentives to make those retrofits happen. Um, and so, I, I mean, again, our vision is really not about sort of just saying, okay, you have to do this. Now, also, it's when you make that change, right? So you're not going to do it just because now it's good for you. But when you're thinking of changing it, is there an opportunity? We want to make sure you see that opportunity and then want to make sure we have, you know, some sort of programs ourselves or that we can connect you to people who have programs to be able to incentivize that change. So if that makes, I mean, that's kind of the thinking for everything that we're laying out, and maybe you can talk about the numbers a little bit. Yeah, just, just to give you a high-level kind of breakdown of what's behind that, you raised very good points, uh, and that's the point about implementation. Um, so, you know, there are something like 300,000 housing units in, in San Jose, and it would be com completely impractical and impossible to assume that overnight you can retrofit each one of those. So in developing the plan, what we've tried to do is look at the business case for a phased retrofit of the housing stock. Or in San Jose. Now, there are two things happening. The retrofit, which um, needs to be worked out what is the right combination of incentives and time of sale kind of um, um, mechanisms you use to encourage uh, householders to implement that, and I think that's for discussion. And the next part of that is the city is going to absorb another 320,000 people just in terms of people being born here and people moving in. And it's how do you set up the right kind of conditions and, and standards for when we require new construction that's happening and that's occurring, that that is electrified um, from the outset. Because you're right, the economics change. Uh, when you, you know, install your gas stove, you com uh, it was being compared to a coal-fired grid. But what's happening now is that uh, the grid in California is being required to uh, be even cleaner and have a great share of renewables. So the economics are constantly improving in favor of uh, clean and sustainable technologies. And the way that the city um, designs its kind of implementation strategy will be important to kind of reflect and minimize any additional costs of what that retrofit actually means for householders and, and kind of shielding them from that as, as best as it can through smart deployment of policy. And Thank we're, you. We're um, kind of getting to 8.30, so we can take a couple more questions. We are here in case you have more questions and others want to leave. Uh, I'm happy to hang out here for as long as you'd like. Just a couple of comments on the plan. Uh, first of all, I do want to say that um, I think that the move toward um, community choice aggregation has been a, a good one. We expect great things out of it. Uh, but in light of that still, um, I th just a comment that the rush to replace um, natural gas and its uses, uh, I think it needs more study and maybe we ought to be looking at the timing and the cost of that, um, as the gentleman just referred to it. Uh, the other thing is, and I realize you do reference uh, the need for the city to have an adaptation and sustainability approach, both of which are not being looked at but is for future topics, but I just caution that these are very important, uh, the concerns uh, uh, for sea level rise um, and the impact it will have in places like El Viso and some of our facilities like the wastewater treatment. Again, another thing that you say will be for future discussion are all very important and really should be a part and should be addressed and I think that needs to be looked at. Yes, Thank you. we agree. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Jake. I'm also with the Green Party of Santa Clara County and I was just curious where the analysis dives into the interconnectivity of San Jose with our surrounding neighbors and the world. 
right? I mean, climate impacts from a financial situation may not hurt San Jose specifically, but will damage the rest of the country in low-lying areas. Um, there are impacts on not addressing, and I know that the plan specifically talks that it's not going to discuss low-income housing and housing affordability because that's in the general plan. And But the fact that that would move people, you know, new complexes, new businesses, new commercial buildings that these partnerships would bring in will push our lowest income um, neighbors further away into other cities where their carbon impact will be you know, soaked up from Morgan Hill or um, further out into the East Bay, right? How does that impact come into our city plan? Because we certainly need to address that Silicon Valley is a megapolis, right? We're not isolated here. Um, and then a second question would be, how do we make sure that we're giving strong um, options for the correct, you know, choices to take for renewables, specifically if we have, you know, cheap uh, solar panels that are coming in but are mined from slave labor um, when their rare earth minerals are being taken from but those are the ones that developers choose to buy because that's the lowest cost for them to fit into what the city mandates would be a net zero uh, energy project. How can we regulate that as, as a city if that's at all possible? Thank you. Um, the second one's kind of tough. I don't know if you have thoughts, but I'm going to take a little bit of time to think about that. On the low income and affordable housing, although the plan doesn't... Um, kind of specifically address that issue. We we did think a lot about sort of how, as I talked in the beginning, you know, we wanted this to be something that works for every sector in San Jose, not just a few. And so we really looked at kind of connections and what could help getting more transit, getting more high density housing near transit does help as when people don't own cars, or, you know, the cost of car ownership is high, providing choices um, on how to get around, how to get to your job, uh, locating the jobs near housing, all of those are, um, um, you know, kind of considerations for when you're looking at different sort of socioeconomic sectors of uh, San Jose. The other uh, couple of things that would be really important to us, so to look at what can we do in terms of energy and water use. So again, as you're looking at sort of the cost of living here, it's obviously housing is a very big cost and there's limited things we can do. There's many other factors at play. But really thinking about what kind of choices could we provide for people so that there is sort of more high density housing that may be you know more affordable near transit and then you have sort of low energy low water use so ongoing costs are a little lower so we we kind of looked at, and then what kind of jobs we could create that were but we could create as and i don't want to say city hall is going to create jobs but with all of these uh strategies that we're embarking on what kind of jobs would be created that could again be for you know not just like the tech sector but it's across a spectrum of uh skill sets and sean anything else you want to add to the first one i'll trip. pause over the trip yeah um well the the second question is a serious question and economists call it externalities and how do you account for the impacts of say solar panels in in, in china and the social and environmental impacts and it's a serious and important question um, it's one that wasn't in the scope of this document, and, and it's, it's also an area that's really emerging in terms of driving an empirical-based way of accounting for all of these things so that good policy can be made. In fact, PwC has done uh, this type of work and has developed a framework around it, um, but it's still something that's really, really evolving. Um, but it is something, but it's also very hard to account for. Yeah, and I'll, I will just say one thing. In developing this work, um, it's, we have to draw the boundary somewhere, and that boundary was very specifically kind of carbon and carbon that's emitted within the city of San Jose. And I don't think we or I personally or anybody that I work with would feel kind of credible to say that 
that we can figure out what, you know, we can solve for low-income housing in other parts of the Bay Area and, like, put a number on that. I think that what depends on, you know, how the strategies that we've developed, such as, you know, densification and focus growth, uh, providing accessibility to transit is actually implemented. And I think the voice, having the voice of the community involved in making sure that the strategies are implemented in such a way that addresses all of those things are really important. It's just that, you know, putting a number on it at this stage is very difficult and it would be kind of pseudoscience at best. Thank you. Um, just quickly then, I'd be curious if there was any economic analysis on the city funds that we do have, right? There are a number of cities that are working to divest their, you know, pensions and portfolios mm -hmm. and taxpayer dollars from fossil fuels. Uh, was that something that was not considered as an option for San Jose to make an impact in the overall carbon emissions, no. or is this plan? No, that's really interesting, and we'll look into it. It wasn't considered in this plan, no. But uh, one other thing, it wasn't considered in this plan. If you actually look to the uh, business playbook, one of the recommendations is that um, if you're an employee working for a company that's able to you know, lobby your employer to switch your... 401k to something that is socially responsible. So looking at socially responsible investments for your, as, a, as a conduit for you to you know, look at your retirement savings is an important thing. And it's like an indication of one of the things that we could, um, that the city of San Jose can work with uh, employers and business owners in the city to, to implement. Hi, uh, I, I just wanted to echo that comment that um, the fact that the city's using our tax dollars to invest in the expand, you know, the production of fossil fuels worldwide seems like something we can reduce carbon emissions. San Francisco is doing this, New York did it, Palo Alto is going to do it. Many, many cities are doing fossil fuel divestment. So it seems like that should be included. But my question was, I noticed that the plan doesn't include any discussion of greenhouse gas emissions from airplanes, even though uh, a large international airport is entirely within the city limits and is operated by the city. So is that because you determined that the emissions from airplanes flying all over the world is insignificantly small, or is that like a protected class of emissions sources that for some reason doesn't count? I mean, we, we did, uh, our starting point was the greenhouse gas emission inventory that was done in 2014, right, Sean? Yes. And that did not include um, airport emissions. There were a few exclusions in there, and we've, we've kind of built on that. Um, it, it would be worthwhile taking another look at that for sure, to see if there's other things. I mean, yeah. um, I don't know if PwC has done other plans, if you can talk to that, like LA, yeah. when and, you did and, that. Uh, an airport is an interesting one because you're right, it's a, you know, a huge part of our um, global emissions footprint. But as I mentioned earlier, part of this is actually drawing the boundary in a way that is meaningful to San Jose. And so we wouldn't want to account for every international flight that's uh, occurring or originating or terminating in San Jose, at San Jose International, but we might want to look at uh, in the future, you know, the idle time on taxiways and runways and, and that kind of thing. So it's a combination of not that data not being available to us in terms of developing the inventory. And the second question, if and when it does become available, what is the right way in which we draw the boundaries around that? Thank you. I just wanted to follow up and say that my concern is simply that if we are, as a city, taking climate action, then the emissions produced by the flights coming in and out of the city's airport aren't going to be um, allocated or aren't going to be taken care of by any other jurisdiction. San the city of Santa Clara isn't going to account for that. The county of Santa Clara isn't going to account for that. Nobody's making any effort to reduce emissions from all of those airplanes yet, and I think it would be critical that this city has it on the radar. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have a, a quick logistical question. There's still um, some hands raised. Do you want to uh, take these questions with the microphone, or do you want to take it offline? What's, what's your um, preference? I mean, if everybody is continue? interested and people okay. want to say that's Great. fine, I okay. can Thank you. take the question. Um, yeah, I had a question. It was kind of floated around earlier, so I guess it, it was around... Uh, how this plan was going to include uh, 
residents in the moderate to low income uh, spectrum. Uh, but so I'll just kind of make a, a quick statement that there are, um, I encourage uh, that, uh, that the plan include collabor uh, collaboration with already existing nonprofits. Uh, there are, uh, I work for a nonprofit called Grid Alternatives, um, in which we help uh, low income families get free, uh, free solar and free electricity. So the programs are out there. Uh, and there's a lot of programs that are really helping uh, families with, um, with energy efficiency as well. So I really encourage that you uh, try to establish those uh, collaborations uh, with those nonprofits that are already doing the work. Absolutely, and uh, Grid Alternatives was part of our technical uh, stakeholder workshop as well when lo looking forward to partnering with them. I just had a quick question. I just had a quick question regarding the practice to, to be sustainable. So for example, I'm not so sure if the strategy goes into tackling take back programs. So if you want to reduce greenhouse gases, obviously one measure to do that is incentives to do solar panels. But solar panels in their own right at the end of their life cycle yeah. are not necessarily the best environmental friendly product out there. So I'm just kind of curious to know does this strategy in the sense of cost benefit analysis take into consideration maybe measures that promote take back programs from private sectors or private industries? Um, I'll, I'll start with just sort of conceptually. I mean, we, um, you know, as I mentioned, solid waste is not in the plan right now. Um, that's definitely an area that we want to look at in the next iteration because again, we were limited in scope on this plan per council direction. Um, it, as we look at our solid waste goals and sort of, uh, you know, the 100% diversion from landfills, that's one area that we really need to be working in is sort of producer responsibility, right? So including take backs. Now in terms of the analysis, Sean, you wanna talk to sort of what we considered and didn't consider? Yeah, so, um as I've mentioned, the, the plan looked at the economic costs and benefits, and what we mean by that in the specific example that you raise is, you know, we look at the amortization of a solar panel. So you install one today, in 25 years, it's gonna degrade over that time, uh, and the efficiency reduces, and you're gonna need to replace it. So we look at the kind of economic process through which you uh, would need to kind of replenish your stock each time. Um, what you're allu uh, alluding to in terms of, you know, the specific buyback programs for, to allow that to happen, that's a financial cost that is not factored into the plan. That has been part of the scope. Um, good evening. Um, I'm a citizen of San Jose, and I just want to say that I'm extremely proud to be a citizen of a city that is taking on something like this. And, um, and I'm totally committed to the plan. I'm totally committed to what comes, what comes out of it. I am clear that I don't have the expertise that's needed, and I don't think any one of us has right. any of the expertise that's needed to figure out how we're gonna do this. But um, I just wanna thank everybody who's involved and say I'm completely in, and I know there are some problems we need to work out, but the, you know, what's at stake is so important. I think we need to say I'm in, and then figure out how we need to do it. Um, so along those lines, thank you everybody who's involved in this, and I know some of you have put in, uh, put in a lot of effort. Um, one of the things that I haven't heard that's of great interest to me in this housing thing is I'm permanently disabled. I'm on a very low income, and coming up with more jobs isn't gonna help me. Um, so I haven't heard the space for how we deal with those of us, those of us who are older, those of us who are permanently disabled, how the housing, you know, how we're gonna come, it's a, it's a huge issue for me. I rent a room in a house of a friend and that is not gonna be there forever and I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> when that goes away. Um, so when I hear the plans of what we're doing in the future, which I'm very committed to and very engaged in, I kinda wanna hear what's there for me too or be involved in the discussion around that and, and how we deal with that. Thank you, and thanks Thanks for your interest, and um, we would absolutely love to engage with you if you have ideas. I mean, we definitely don't have all the answers, so which is why we need sort of, you know, engaging people that can bring different solutions uh, to the table. And along the lines with that, um, I'm very happy to hear that we're 
connecting it with the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting place to look. I know this was designed to be specifically deal with um, carbon emissions and the right. climate plan. Um, the sustainable development goals, which San Jose is now a model city for, deals with many of these other social justice right. issues. And the more we can bring that in and hook that up, I think the more we're gonna get answers from other cities that are doing it, from other people, you know, mm -hmm. from people that are, are creating plans for that, which there are extensive networks worldwide. Yes, yes, that's exciting. We got to, uh, the director, Kerry Romanow and I got to go spend some time with the SDG folks um, about a, a week and a half ago, yeah. and uh, people from many different cities and parts of the world, and it, it was it was great because you know it's all the innovation and kind of hearing from others how they've implemented certain things. So we're looking forward to hopefully entering into a partnership pretty soon. Fabulous, thank you. Okay, I ha I don't see. Oh, yeah, this. First of all, thank you so much for staying late and answering our questions. Um, I guess one of the concerns that I um, am hearing and also I had when I first read the report is that it seems to have been developed uh, quite separately and not in alignment with what the city has been doing and the challenges that the city actually is facing and how they're facing them. You know, the folks who typically sit behind you over there just sold the biggest piece of land in recent history to Google in an exclusive agreement. That land could have been used for I extremely low-income housing and low-income housing, very low-income housing. We have now four categories in San Jose for low-income housing, and we're probably gonna have more. Um, the plan addresses the affordable housing is mentioned in one of these pillars, but it literally refers to solar panels and how to make living conditions more affordable. That doesn't help a homeless person, mm -hmm. right? So not that this is an issue that this plan has to address, but to understand how to align this plan to the direction that the city has already taken is pretty important. Uh, schools are closing and we're not, we're not opening new schools, Oak Ridge is closing, yet the plan talks about how great it is to have schools that are local and reduced on you know, commute time. Uh, we, a third of our workers are in invisible workers. Those are the janitors and the dishwashers who don't live anywhere near here. Increasing density by having developers be part of this plan and part of the many decisions that the city council makes isn't gonna help people who really can't afford even one room in this city. Those people aren't driving Teslas four hours a day to their homes you know, many miles away, right? So when your plan already admits that half of the greenhouse gases are being produced through transportation and it literally doesn't enforce or highlight how important public transportation is. I know there's a section in there. I read how detailed it is. It isn't detailed enough or clear enough that how the Department of Transportation working with three other organizations is going to actually address this huge deficit we have in public transport. You showed a graph that very nicely put San Jose right in the middle of our carbon footprint. Well, that's interesting. We are far worse per capita than Tokyo and Hong Kong. We're also, and so that may mean that we should increase density. However, we're far worse than Copenhagen and Amsterdam. That Amsterdam isn't that different in population from us. So public transport is a huge part of this solution. And affordable housing is a huge hurdle to this. But those aren't being elevated over and above installing solar panels and some of the other important parts of this plan. So my problem with this plan is that it is not at all aligned with what the city council is doing and what they continue to do. So if it's not informed by the policies that the city council is going to continue, how could this plan be successful? How could all the organizations that we hope to engage make a change? where the financial and, and developer restrictions and, and influences, just like Google, being listed on the slide you showed as a major employer here, you know, they're not even here, but they're already listed on your slide. 
So there, there are kind of incongruities in this plan that concern people like me who have seen the direction this, you know, this uh, city council has taken. And actually, a friend of mine mentioned one word again in the plan that concerns a lot of people like me and you know, climate activists like myself, which was something like, uh, what was it, Andrew, that cars are the best thing that happened for the good life? You know, it, <laughs> I mean, it's a climate plan, and if the statement in there is that um, the automobile has been the single greatest enabler of the good life, and it's the good life we're trying to promote, you know, take that as advice or input. There is some tuning that should be done in the way the plan is communicated to people to make us feel like stakeholders at it, because it isn't right now. Thank you. So just quickly, I'll address what you just talked about. That should be Good Life 1.0. That's what we're trying to get away from. So cars were the greatest sort of, you know, advancer of Good Life 1.0. We don't want to be there. So we want to be at the 2.0 version, which is what we're talking about, walkable neighborhoods. So just to kind of clarify that, um, I know you, you kind of... Um, covered a lot there, covered a lot of ground, and some of those things um, I don't know that we can address through this plan, but I don't quite agree that we're not aligned with some of the actions. I mean, f for this plan, we've worked very closely with all of our departments um, that are working on different council priorities. Uh, I know we all feel the lack of housing, but it's not a San Jose problem only. I mean, we really do need more jobs. I mean, we need to change that imbalance that doesn't help us with our revenues, right? And for all the services we need to provide. So we do need more jobs. Yes, we need more housing, but you know, a lot of the surrounding cities need much more housing because they benefit from a much higher number of jobs and not providing the housing. And then we have people living here and driving, and it's it's not a sustainable equation when you look when you look um, 30 years out. So yes, we have to build housing, that's affordable, but we also have to bring in a lot of jobs. I mean, we can't we can't get we're not going to be successful in terms of city revenues if we don't have that. And we need the revenues to be able to provide the services to build out the infrastructure. Now, public infrastructure is, um, you know, public transit infrastructure is extremely important. The city has limited control over it, so our role is going to be to try and influence that, influence the acceleration of certain things. But we're already, you know, planning for BART to be here. We're planning for a. Um, pretty robust hub of public transit, right, at Durdon. So, I mean, there's, there's movement that's taking us, it's 10 years out, 15 years out, there's movement that's taking us there, but again, the city hall plays a limited role. The, a lot of it happens at the regional level, um, at the state level, and again, our role is going to be to make sure we're advocating for that in San Jose. Um, and it's, I mean, it's crucial. Like without that, the plan, there are certain key things without that, the plan doesn't work. And we, we, can't, we can't bring businesses in. We cannot come up with new technologies. We can, I mean, City Hall cannot do all that. So that's what we have to really kind of look at the gaps. Where can we provide value? And then how do we leverage everybody else, whether it's a community that can do certain things within their neighborhoods? right, um, businesses that can kind of work on amazing technologies but who could also partner with community groups to kind of do whole neighborhoods and go to zero net energy or do some major water savings. I mean, we didn't talk a lot about water. And, and again, I know when you look at the big picture, that may not seem that we're contributing much towards what's kind of a structural housing problem and cost of living, but the plan is limited in its scope. Right, so that's where we're kind of trying to make the connections. <clears throat> so, um, 
I was just curious, the the Google plan, is, I just imagine that it'll end up being like a spaceship, the Apple spaceship, which it may not be, and I could be off base there, but I, I thought the point might have been that that building structure, that development is kind of counterintuitive to what the plan says about having new development be you know, vertically integrated and efficient and, and walkable, close and walking distance, open. right? Yes. So yes. that was the side that's point the that vision. I it's not a spaceship for sure. That's the vision. I mean, that's the vision. You know, we we're far away from something actually being built. Yeah. So, and yeah. so I just wanted to point that out. But then, um, I, again, thank you guys for this amazing work. It's complicated and and nuanced in a lot of ways. And I know you did mention that you can only when you do these kind of plans right. only set your scope so large. Right. right. Um, so thank you. It it's a lot of great resources and information to go off of as we all move forward. Um, my question is, if the city council adopts this plan next week, what changes? We, I don't know what changes, we're able to move forward on certain actions we've kind of um, talked about that we want to target in the near term, in the next three years, so we get to do that. Uh, departments kind of get to look at their priorities that support the implementation, make sure that in the budget, the annual budget process, those are covered. Um, we are able to get our person on board uh, to implement this plan and to kind of go out and engage all of, you know, all the stakeholders that we talked about and uh, start fundraising. Because, um, and I mentioned this a little bit before, that we got that PG&E uh, challenge money to get this started. Our commitment is that it would fund, you know, this person and some other implementation work for the next two years, but after that it really needs to be self-sustaining. And so, um, you know, we need to get, get started on that pretty quickly. Okay, so just so that I'm in the right mindset about this. This is to adopt some of these, you know, three-year, five-year, ten-year targets and then instruct city personnel to start engaging in collaborations and workshops and, and partnerships in the future. And some city actions that are called out. And again, it comes through the budget process, the annual budget process to council in June, and then we anticipate coming uh, with an update on this plan, sort of you know, every time we'll come with priorities and progress on how we're doing in fall and then every six months from then on. Cool, thank you. Thank you, I do appreciate a lot that there are these interim goals mm -hmm. in, in all the different um, strategies, 2030, 2040, 2050, with numbers on it. and. Since transportation is the big chunk of the total, 58% of the greenhouse gas emissions, I know that it's important for the city, for the residents in the city and people working in the city to switch from driving cars to alternative modes of transportation. And I see in that chart that to meet these goals, solo driving by commuting is supposed to drop basically in half from 82% of the residents to 46% of the residents. Public transit use is supposed to go from 4 to 10 percent, and walking and bicycling is supposed to explode from 3.7 to 20 percent. So those numbers are all like radical transformation in how people travel in San Jose in just 12 years. Yep. And I know it says in the plan, you know, local jobs and densifying neighborhoods are going to help contribute to that over time. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that it's realistic to expect such a radical transformation in 12 years. It would mean like in six years, we gotta be halfway to those numbers. So in six years, 20% of the people are suddenly stop driving to work and take another mode when we do not have public transit expansion right. plans to support that right now, anywhere close. Uh, so my concern is there's like, a, there's like something missing to achieve those. And it's not linear, I think, in, in that example, right? Like if, if BART comes, I mean, it's not a linear thing where if BART's in downtown San Jose, it changes things. Um, 
So there may be sort of inflection points where we're looking at different um, assumptions. There is a uh, bike plan um, 2020, right, Sean, that we're working on. A um, um, lot of kind of bus networks. So there are plans, there's assumptions, and that's why I talked about it as a live document. If things don't actually, I mean, that's what's envisioned, not just in this plan. So we built on a, built upon a lot of documents and plans that are already in place, uh, whether it's city plans or regional plans. And so again, if those don't quite get realized, then we need to kind of relook at our numbers. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the framing for this plan is that it is aspirational. Um, that doesn't mean that it's unattainable. It means that, you know, numbers tell us that it's possible, but it's aspirational. We could have, you know, halved the numbers and made it a lot easier and said by 2030 we'll do half as much, but that would just mean a very mediocre plan. And what we really want to do is create the right kind of forum for the community to participate and work with, you know, with the, the city government on coming up with solutions that can be implemented at scale for each of these things. Because you're right, you know, we're talking about, you know, the radical transformation of the city in terms of how it uses energy and how people get around. That's what's required by the Paris Climate Agreement. If we don't subscribe to that, then we're not going to meet um, our, you know, our, our commitment and our trajectory. And I think I mentioned at the start that you know, 400 cities across the US had signed up to honor and adopt the Paris Agreement. A lot of those cities um, are only st now starting to realize what that means for their transformation, you know, moving from you know, suburban, um, sprawling uh, urban metropolitan areas anchored by highways and big box retail into a model that is um, looking at you know focused growth, um, public transit accessibility, uh, walkable and livable uh, neighborhoods, and the integration of all of that. And that's why we feel that Climate Smart San Jose has by necessity needed to be aspirational to kind of to to you know reach for you know um, the type of change and the rate of change that is implied by the Paris Agreement. Because if you don't, you don't meet it. Okay, I think that may be it. Is there, oh. uh, I'll let you guys go right after this, I promise. <laughs> um, I was just curious, you mentioned the aspirations of the Paris Climate Agreement, and there are a lot of you know, climate justice and environmental activists that think that the Paris Climate Agreement didn't go far enough. Were there any 1.5 degrees Celsius targets that you guys looked at prior to proposing this plan? <laughs> two, two degrees is hard enough. No, um, the, you know I know there's kind of a two degrees with a goal of 1.5. Um, when we started it, we really started to look at two, and um, that I mean, if we get there, I think we're going to be pretty happy. Yeah, I mean, um, I think. We started off with a two degree plan just because the rate of transformation is like that much and what I'm what I'm describing in my head is that the distance between the baseline and the reduction pathway right and then what 1.5 does it makes it like that much bigger so getting to two degrees alone is difficult um, but what that means is because the the way that the city had scoped this plan to focus on energy mobility and sustainable water it had a very kind of clear and smaller definition of the GHG inventory it means that there are other solutions that haven't been factored in yet which could potentially move us onto a 1.5 degrees pathway that could be the airport for example and it could be natural and working land so all those things are possible but I think the main takeaway is that we need to make steps towards getting onto that two degree pathway ASAP because the longer we the longer we leave it the harder it becomes yeah good point uh, because we have talked about that sort of how it could contribute to additional maybe not 1.5 but go further so okay well thank you so much really appreciate you spending time with us um, I'm happy to stay here if you have additional questions or uh, feel free to connect with us um, by email through our website and look forward to engaging with all of you on the actual implementation. We're really excited about it and hope it's going to be a great thing for San Jose in its future. Thank you.